You mentioned your CIO, Doug. What's his superpower and what's allowed him to perform at a high level for so many decades? The first the superpower, I think of him as a, a renaissance man. He does everything well all at the same time and in a modest fashion. You wouldn't know it from talking to him, but both in his personal pursuits as well as his professional pursuits, he has a measured and thoughtful and incisive approach to our portfolio, but also everything else that goes along with it in terms of monitoring markets and sources of information and communicating with stakeholders and really intimately knowing different areas of the university and how they are related to the efforts that we're undertaking on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell me about how you build your mastermind of peers and how you get better as an LP by knowing other LPs. Rob, I've been excited to chat since our friend Jeff Smith from the Smithsonian Institute introduced us. Welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thanks very much. Really excited to be here. Grateful for Jeff's uh, introduction. Excited to have you. So tell me about the University of Rochester strategy. The university was fortunate to get a relatively early start in the endowment business due to George Eastman's success with inventing photography here, founding Kodak, generous donations to the university about 100 years ago. So this made us one of the top five endowments in the country in the mid-1900s. Uh, we're a Division three school with a smaller alumni base than the Ivy League and other institutions. So we have not remained above, among the largest, but we're still punching above our weight in the top 50, uh, thanks mainly to the generosity of the donors who have followed Eastman's example. Uh, we have around $3.5 billion in the endowment today and a team of 10 in the investment office. I'm one of four generalist investment officers, plus one analyst, one intern, great team of four on the operations side that work with our CIO, Doug Phillips. On the investment side, we each have responsibility for sourcing and monitoring managers across asset classes. And uh, we're fortunate to have some highly experienced members with significant and tenure on our investment committee, along with some engaged and insightful newcomers who are great supporters of the university. At a top level, our strategy is to maintain a relatively concentrated portfolio of the highest quality managers across asset classes and geographies. Our top 10 is over 40% of the portfolio and over 80% of our portfolios in our top 40. We've managed to perform well over most periods, uh, generally capturing around two thirds of the upside of the MSCI All Country World Index, our benchmark on the equity side, while only taking about half of the downside. Compared to your peers, you have a very concentrated strategy. What's the rationale behind your highly concentrated strategy? I think both access and focus and being a small team. We do travel the world, but we know we can't cover all the uh, opportunities in every asset class and every geography and, and new themes and strategies. So being concentrated enables us to find uh, the best and brightest in different categories to create a diversified portfolio while still having meaningful positions as well as relationships. And with four of us investment officers with primary responsibility for relationships, if we had 200 line items, that would be you know, less meaningful interaction than our you know, 40 to 50 active line items, as well as, again, trying to make each impactful to the portfolio. So those are the main reasons for the concentration. What are the pros and cons of using a generalist strategy? Well, one main benefit is that we actively source and evaluate managers across all asset classes and geographies. Each of us do that. So we have a good understanding of our entire portfolio and what the best complements could be to the existing manager group globally, regardless of category. So this brings more voices and perspectives into the room when we're evaluating the portfolio and hopefully leads to better decision-making. You manage three and a half billion at University of Rochester. Tell me about your top level portfolio construction. Sure. Well, when I joined in uh, 2013, we were in the low 50s percent range in alternative assets uh, as a whole. Uh, that's increased slightly to the upper 50s percent range now, partly from appreciation, uh, as well as a number of additional manager allocations since then. Included in that almost 60 percent number is about 30 percent in private equity split between buyouts and venture with a bid in distressed and credit. And then a hedge fund allocation of about 25 27% or so, with uh, about two-thirds of that in diversifying strategies of different kinds and one-third in long-short equity hedge funds. And then besides that, 55-60%, we have about 8 to 10% in fixed income and cash, and most of the remaining third or so in long-only equities globally. And uh, these are reviewed every fall when we meet with our investment committee to plan for the coming year. 
What are you discussing when you decide whether you want to update your portfolio construction? Well, a number of things. Over the summer, we always uh, reconnect with a number of different stakeholders around the university, investment committee members, of course, but also deans of the various schools, the finance team at the university and other stakeholders. Um, we take their input. We are, of course, doing our ongoing top-down research on, on market themes and trends, and then our bottom-up view of the opportunity set in managers, both in our own portfolio as well as those that we're tracking that we think might be uh, good compliments to the portfolio. We triangulate all that information and have a conversation with, with the committee and are generally only making gradual changes each year to each asset class. When it comes to looking at re-upping in your managers, what qualitative and quantitative factors are you considering when making those decisions? One way we uh, think about new allocations is top down. So we're looking for something specific and uh, the manager is specializing in that area. One of my favorite aspects of our role is market mapping, uh, where we seek to identify as many opportunities as possible within a specific country or a subsector like biotech. And then we generally, we have a couple of those going on at any one time and really dive deep. Uh, in, in that area of our portfolio, as well as the opportunity set. And then number, another way is bottom up, where we'll get referred to a manager through a committee member or a peer endowment or, or another source, or come across them ourselves from our research, and then just get to know them one-on-one -on -one over time. Then either way, the initial screen is to try to find an exposure that we don't have it yet in our portfolio that we are actively seeking and evaluate the best managers of that strategy or something in the area that we already have, but in a different approach or focus that complements our existing exposures there, like a new type of diversifying hedge fund that we don't have yet, or a lower mid-market buyout manager to complement the larger ones that we have. And how much does University of Rochester look at macro factors when finalizing allocations for the next year? It's tempting to say not at all, since we are aware of our lack of ability to predict the future for markets or asset classes. And we want to maintain a broadly diversified portfolio to uh, minimize drawdowns while delivering sufficient return to meet the university's spending needs. However, each part of the portfolio does rest on the belief that we will be rewarded in the future for exposures in that category, whether it's an industry or geography or strategy. Um, some of our allocations do come up from a bottom-up conviction in the talent of an individual manager and the organization they have built, uh, such as our own Rochester alum, Paul Singer at Elliott. Uh, and that sort of allocation doesn't rely on any future prognostication. But uh, some allocations do arise from the belief that future outperformance is coming from an industry like technology or healthcare or a geography or region like India or Asia. So we do do some prognostication uh, after triangulating information from the research sources I, I mentioned earlier, our own stakeholders, peers we trade notes with, podcasts like this one, of course. Uh, and then develop views on the potential of, of investments in that way. When we last chatted, you said that you're not really active in real assets or fixed income. Why is that? Uh, we are becoming a little bit more active in fixed income now since there do seem to be more opportunities for alpha there than there have been in recent years with, with rates higher and other volatility drivers. Even if the Fed lowers rates as much and as quickly as the market thinks that they will, which I don't personally think will happen, uh, there will continue to be interesting opportunities uh, in fixed income. But we believe that uh, equity-related strategies will continue to deliver higher returns over the long term compared to fixed income. Uh, it's definitely useful for liquidity to have a reasonable amount of, of fixed income in the, in the portfolio. So that it definitely has its, its place. What about real estate? Is real estate an inferior assets for non-taxable investors like University of Rochester? I certainly can't say it's uh, inferior, but uh, just it's, it's our uh, strategy where we used to have an active real assets program, uh, private investments in energy focused funds and real estate focused funds. But uh, on a relative basis, those areas consistently underperformed our portfolio of venture and bio funds so that we gradually refocus our efforts uh, onto private equity for the marginal illiquid dollar. Tell me about your venture portfolio. Sure. We have a concentrated program, as we talked about before, within private equity overall, uh, with just a few long-term relationships uh, holding most of the assets in that portfolio for us. Uh, we try to capture as much of the opportunity set as we can uh, with a few line items, keeping the manager numbers to a minimum and staying within our liquidity constraints. Uh, within venture, it's about 90% Sequoia for us and 10% opportunistic compliments that we've found every few years. And I would expect that will continue, meaning we'll continue investing with Sequoia as well as continue our efforts to find interesting complementary exposures every so often. 
you've gotten into the most difficult to access, arguably, venture fund in the world. How have you built that relationship and how do you retain access? Well, initial credit certainly to our CIO, Doug Phillips. One of the first things uh, he did when he joined here in 2000 was develop some of the relationships that we maintain today, Sequoia being among the first. Uh, and then since then, consistently investing with them across their platform and across cycles, and then remaining engaged with all geographic and strategic areas of their firm, uh, acting as a value-added partner, making some introductions uh, as appropriate to areas of our university, for example, uh, certainly maintaining confidentiality. Uh, and then importantly, our, our fortunate position as a university that has a leading medical center, music school, business school, engineering school, so much more. And they're very mindful of where the profits that they generate are going, which really helps us uh, in that sense. So we're far from being among their largest LPs, but uh, we seek to maintain a mutually productive relationship. You mentioned that your CIO built that relationship in 2000. What's the best practice as it comes to building relationships with top GPs? And try to be mutually productive, um, you know, be mindful of, of what they're trying to accomplish. And to the extent it's in your power, help them do that, whether it's not overburdening them with, with uh, inquiries, but maintaining um, communication and connectivity to your own special sauce. So in, in our case, again, we have a, a world leading medical center and business school and other areas. And to the extent their portfolio might benefit from connections there, we, we do that. We try to give them any insights that we have. There aren't many that we have that they don't, but, but uh, anytime uh, we can offer those, we do that. And then continue communicating to them uh, what sets us apart to make sure that they're aware that uh, their efforts are going towards the, the great causes that, that we support and develop ourselves. You guys are extremely selective when it comes to new managers. What do you look for in new managers? Well, I would say top down and bottom up. So top down, we're looking for uh, something specific sometimes, whether it's a geography or industry that we uh, feel optimistic about based on our research and also see is not as well represented in our portfolio yet. Uh, getting back to the market mapping exercise where we'll say we don't have any biotech exposure. Let's get to know every biotech manager across private to public and compare and contrast and, and see if any of them uh, are a fit uh, in our particular portfolio. Um, and then there's certainly the bottom up where we'll get referred to a manager through an investment committee member or a peer endowment or foundation or some other part of our research, and just one-on-one -on -one get to know them over time. Um, so it's, it's about the fit in our portfolio. And then, of course, we do the Usual steps of diligence once uh, the potential top-down fit is established. So what are some of your pet peeves for emerging managers? I think I might be an outlier here a bit since uh, I, I hear a lot that people want you know, punchy, high-level, short summary information uh, as an introduction. Uh, but for, for me, I prefer to get all relevant information in the introduction so I can better evaluate the potential fit and save both of us time in case I can discern an issue that wouldn't work for us. Uh, the backgrounds of the team, their connectivity to the strategy they're trying to execute, uh, why they are right for this particular time and place in the industry that they're targeting, competitive landscape, edge. Uh, it's As much detail as possible is helpful for me to screen. So the pet peeve is sending one high-level paragraph, maybe a one-pager to go with it and saying, hey, can we have a hour-long conversation? And uh, again, we learn a lot from every conversation we have. It is a privilege to speak with these experts in their craft. It's not at all a waste of time, but the math doesn't work to have discussions with everybody. So for me, uh, more information up front is, is always helpful. Congratulations, 10X Capital Podcast listeners. We have officially cracked the top 10 rankings in the United States for investing. Please help this podcast continue climbing up in the rankings by clicking the follow button above. This helps our podcast rank higher, which brings more revenue to the show and helps us bring in the very highest quality guests and to produce the very highest quality content. Thank you for your support. Do you think there's a bias against strategies and asset classes where you can't ex explain it, you know, standing on one foot? And do you think that there's an inverse relationship between the simplicity of a strategy and its ability to produce alpha? I think two different questions there. Uh, I don't know that there's a upfront bias, but people find their own ways to do their jobs most efficiently. So it, it is certainly an uphill battle to try to educate uh, someone like me that, that doesn't understand the strategy as well as the other more commonplace uh, strategies that generally find themselves into a portfolio. So it's certainly more challenging. And I've experienced that uh, kind of on both sides of, of that equation to explain the fit in the portfolio and the value. I would say, on the other hand, there are a lot of people in 
our seat on the LP side, actively searching for strategies like that. By definition, following the crowd, you're going to perform like the crowd. So uh, a lot of us actively seek out those strategies that might be a little bit harder to explain, but uh, have alpha potential that many others might not. You mentioned your job is reading, writing, and relationships. Can you break that down for me? Sure. Well, reading first, uh, make sure we're up on current opportunity sets and including them into our portfolio. Uh, There's the required reading that uh, our managers had letters and and reports and and all that, of course. And then we try to source interesting and differentiated additional sources of information, uh, whether from our managers or research services, news reports, conversations with peers, your podcasts, of course. (laughs) So reading's a a big part of the job. Then writing uh, to report on our existing portfolio uh, and the changes that we're planning to the stakeholders around the university, of course, the investment committee, uh, also any others that aren't involved in or or affected by our results. Uh, Clear and concise writing is a a skill that will outlast GPT-4 or 5 or or whatever it is. And then relationships, uh, a key aspect of sourcing new opportunities, evaluating and maintaining them, uh, as well as our relationship with stakeholders and peers and across the industry in general. So relationships are are very key as well. Uh, To me, those are the three pillars of success. I know you know several of our previous guests. Tell me about how you build your mastermind of peers and how you get better as an LP by knowing other LPs. Oh, yeah. How, how much time do we have here for this? I'm, I'm really lucky uh, to have a number of mentors. For example, CIOs, Doug Phillips here at Rochester, of course, being the most influential for me. It's been amazing to spend uh, over a decade with him and the team here uh, so far uh, and learning from other great investors uh, through the years. When we meet them, we have separate one-on-ones or we'll see each other in the halls at a conference or when some of them are very generous with their time and expertise, like a Ken Miranda at Cornell and Tom Linehan at Wallace, Stefan Strine at Cleveland Clinic and Carl Shear at Cincinnati and so many others I can name uh, that I'd love to. But And then some who aren't CIOs yet, but who are will be. And uh, some of my closest friends, like you mentioned, the, the, the two that connected me uh, to your podcast, definitely must listen episodes. Jeff Smith from Smithsonian, as you mentioned, also Hari Shahe from Northwestern. They did such a great job on here uh, describing the unique parts of their program. And then, of course, my wonderful colleagues, uh, Rich and Salako and Steve Groves and Claudio Rosario and Ryan Kirchhoff and our operations team. They're also out there in markets, learning things, interactions around the office are both fun and meaningful. And we'll get into um, IADI as well, hopefully, too. Our co-founders, Stephanie Weston and Sophia Sai and Bhakti Merchandani, who have been so energetic and passionate in that effort. You mentioned your CIO, Doug. What's his superpower and what's allowed him to perform at a high level for so many decades? The first the superpower, I, I think of him as a, a renaissance man. So uh, I don't know if he'll, he'll hear this and it's like kissing up to the boss, but uh, he does everything well all at the same time and in a modest fashion. He, he, you wouldn't you know, know it from talking to him, but both in his personal pursuits as well as his professional pursuits, he has a uh, measured and thoughtful and incisive approach to our portfolio, but also everything else that goes along with it in terms of monitoring uh, markets and sources of information and communicating with stakeholders and really intimately knowing different areas of the university and how they are related to the efforts that, that we're undertaking on a day-to-day basis. And then he's so intellectually curious in, in other parts of his life as well. He's an accomplished athlete across a, a number of different sports and he will no interesting stories about any topic that you, you'll be able to bring up over dinner. So it's a, I think it's the zest for life and continuous learning and measured approach. Renaissance man. You've been at University of Rochester for over 11 years. What makes you so excited to invest out of the seat? I'd say Rochester being really closest to my heart, transplanted Rochester and didn't grow up here, but my wife did and my kids are. And this university is just an amazing place to be a part of. It's also a a renaissance person uh, in its own right. We have a world leading medical center, music school, Eastman, that's right there with Juilliard and the other uh, world leading schools, a business program, uh, you know, similarly well situated engineering, the Hagem School, optics was developed here in ways that unparalleled globally. So there's so many exceptional programs here. And then when we're trying to support all of these different efforts, the privilege of of working here and getting to know the opportunity set globally and applying it to all these ways that the university makes the world better, we're privileged to come to work here every day and partner with each other and partner with our external managers and benefit current and future generations of students, faculty, staff, and and other stakeholders here. So it's just a, a joy to be a part of. You're co-founder of IADEI. Tell me about the organization that you co-founded. 
Sure. Uh, that came about in, in 2020 uh, in response to a call to action across our university from our president, Sarah Mangelsdorf, uh, after George Floyd's murder and the resulting upheaval in society. And we all looked internally to see what we could do better. Long story short, in our area, we looked at our portfolio and how we source and evaluate opportunities to see uh, how we could do it better, what else we can include that made sense. Partnered with Pakti Mirchandani and Sophia Sai at the Trinity Church Endowment in New York, who are working on similar projects, we are undertaking a number of different activities, like a series of uh, pitch session events where we allow our members to nominate and vote on managers in, in different categories uh, to present. Out of our uh, database, we generally get up around 100 LPs plugging into these events out of the over 700 that have signed up in our membership. And we have over 1,300 GPs listed in, in our database so far, which has turned from a spreadsheet that, that Stephanie had created into a really nice searchable database uh, from Clade, a, a wonderful software firm that's kindly doing it uh, pro bono. You're looking to amplify uh, diverse managers by giving them access to a broader set of LP, institutional LPs. That's exactly right. I mean, any one of us, our programs aren't going to change the world by ourselves, even if we turned our focus to actively seeking managers out, which we don't. We don't have a mandate uh, to do that. We're just one small corner of the market, so we want to convene as many as we can and highlight the efforts, as you rightly noted, of, of women and minority-led funds. When you look at investing, is it all about picking managers that will perform for several decades? Is there ever a rationale to picking a, a manager or a strategy for a certain market cycle, call it three years, five years, 10 years? There's definitely a rationale or strategy for that. I would say it's almost a weakness if you don't do it, if you're not able to do something like that, because we should be through our research, through our connections, we should be able to find dislocations, some of which might be temporary. Uh, to take advantage of. It is challenging for smaller teams, back to your question, generalists versus specialists, it's challenging for, for generalists sometimes as well to identify those, evaluate them, get them into the portfolio quickly enough that the opportunity hasn't played itself out uh, because we do find strength in our long-term relationships and long-term focus for our portfolio, but that doesn't lend itself as easily to taking advantage of near-term market trends. What would you like our listeners to know about you, University of Rochester, or anything else you'd like to shine a light on? We've talked about IEDEI. That would have been one of them. Anybody that wants to get involved, whether it's a GP that wants to sign up easily. So through our website on the database curated by Clade and hopefully participate in some of our LPGP interactions that we support, or whether it's an LP that uh, wants to have that resource to uh, source new investment opportunities for their portfolio as well as network with their peers, uh, trying to figure out the challenges related to portfolio construction that that presents. So that was uh, certainly one area. And then uh, Rochester would be the other one. Uh, we'd love to collaborate, whether it's with peers or, or new investment strategies and styles. Thank you, Rob, for jumping on. Look forward to meeting in person Rochester, New York City very soon. That would be great. Thank you very much. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below.